Everybody's quiet, so I feel like I should go. So I'm going to do that. It's good to see everybody out this morning. Welcome to Lost River Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, welcome. We are just obviously this morning about to start a gospel meeting with Justin Hornback, who you heard just a moment ago. Uh, and we encourage you, obviously, if you have ability to attend that this week. Uh, you are in the Gospel of Matthew. We are discussing Matthew. Uh, and this morning we're in Matthew chapter 11, and we'll start there in just a moment. But before we get going, let's give a word of God to prayer. Our great Heavenly Father, so thankful for this opportunity to come together, to sit at the table, to hear of your Son and his love for us, to acknowledge that, to have this time to spend together studying your word, examining the words here. This morning, dear God, we ask that you would be with us and that you would help us to be receptive to the message of your Son that's in Matthew chapter 11 that we would find comfort when we need to find comfort, that we would find answers when we need to find answers, and that we would take heed of the warnings that are also located in this passage. We ask that you'd be with our hearts and be with our minds, that we would be receptive to these things and receptive to your son, and that we would see him the way that he would have us see him, the way that he truly is, and know that he, God among us, walked among us, served among us, spoke among us, and did many wondrous things, and let us not be stumbled or offended at him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so this morning, as you notice on the screen, we're going to talk about Matthew chapter 11. And Matthew chapter 11 is, a very, is another really great chapter amongst the chapters of Matthew for a number of different reasons. And we're going to talk this morning about doubt, and we're going to talk this morning about disbelief. And we're going to talk about the comfort that we find in Jesus in a very specific way that we find in Matthew chapter 11 um, and, and different groups that this particular chapter is focused on in the way uh, we're entering a new section of Matthew this morning. And, and let's talk about that for just a brief second. So as we've been talking about um, and going through and trying to help break down what Matthew is doing in the literary structure of the book of Matthew, you'll recall that in Matthew the first Roughly the first seven chapters, we talk about uh, Matthew and Jesus' announcement and that the initial opening of the book is repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we've been talking in those chapters, obviously, about the, king, the coming of the kingdom of heaven, uh, announcing that the kingdom of heaven was coming, and that culminating, obviously, in the Sermon on the Mount. And then in the long section that we were just in, in 8 through 10, uh, we saw that the kingdom comes, or the king, and the king uh, comes, and he impacts people's lives. Uh, and I, there's a J.R.R. Tolkien who is getting new fame now because of the Amazon series, um, and he wrote Lord of the Rings and was friends with C.S. Lewis and is a Christian author and that kind of thing. Um, he wrote, the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. And he wrote that in parallel about a great king that's in one of his books, but that was meant to be uh, an, an allegory to Christ, that the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. And I thought that that summed up really well chapters 8 through 10, because that's what we see. We see, as we talked about in these past previous classes here, the way that the kingdom affected people in their lives where they were, and what did that result in? All these things. It resulted in a cleansing of a leper, and it resulted in the healing of the centurion servant. We see that he healed Peter's mother-in-law. He saved disciples who were on the stormy seas. He exercised demons. He healed a paralytic. He raised a girl from the dead. He healed a blind man. He caused a mute man to speak. And you'll see that I've highlighted some of those in yellow this morning because there's going to be direct reference to some of these right here in the first few verses of Matthew chapter 11 this morning. Some of this is exactly, in the, and again, this goes back to something I think that we've said over and over again, is Matthew is well written. Matthew is trying to express a point, a very specific point. And he doesn't put things necessarily in chronological order, but he puts things in there and designed to show specific points at specific points in time. And so these miracles come before some comments uh, that Jesus is going to make to John here just in a minute. So like I mentioned, now we're opening up to kind of this third section in the book of Matthew, chapters 11 through 13. Okay, now that the king has come, now that the king is here, 
that God is now that, and remember there were, there were three things from the very outset that we said that Jesus was a new, a new type of Moses, a new David, and Emmanuel, God with us. So now that that character, now that Jesus is among us, how will the Jews respond? How will they respond to the king walking among them? And we're going to see various different responses that come by different people throughout chapters 11 and chapter 12. And they're going to range the whole gamut of things. And sometimes they're not the response that you think. And then eventually we're going to conclude this section in Matthew chapter 13 talking about parables that typify how people respond. Jesus is going to tell a series of parables that explains this is how people are responding to me. And this is why people are responding to me in the way that they're responding. So with that, let's dive into the text this morning. Matthew chapter 11. In the first section, I've labeled this just like I titled this. So I've labeled this in three broad sections of Matthew chapter 11. First, we're going to deal with doubt. Then we're going to deal with disbelief. And then we're going to deal with comfort. And those are, the, those are the main sections in Matthew chapter 11 that we're going to deal with. And we're going to start here. Let's read verses 1 through 6. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John Hurt had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So, Obviously, Jesus uh, has, we just saw in this previous, Jesus has sent out his disciples and now Jesus is going back around and teaching and obviously he's got a multitude around him and however this came to be, there were a couple disciples that were obviously disciples of John and they come and they ask this question on behalf of John. Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Now, what do you think caused, what caused this? What, 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 what would prompt this? Why would, why would this even be a thing? Okay, he's been in prison a while. And what, what might that prompt him? Why? Why, Paula? What's, what does that have to do with anything? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. You can imagine... This isn't a cash bail system. There's not, you know, there's not, hey, why don't my disciples spring me here from the Roman prison? No, he's sitting in prison for some period of time. And he's sitting there thinking, I thought this was going to go very differently. I thought this was going to, I thought this was going to, what has he spent his whole life? You, you, Luke lays this out so well. Luke does some really, I think Luke in the beginning of Luke does a lot of really interesting things. And one of the things that it does really interesting in Luke is it talks about John the Baptist being very special from the get-go. And it seems like just from the earliest age that the spirit drove him out into the wilderness. And everybody in Luke, it talks about everybody's like, what kind of man, what kind of, what kind of child is this going to be? And that's said about John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist has spent his whole life dedicated to the idea that I am the herald, I am Isaiah chapter 40, I am here making the path straight for the one who is to come. And now suddenly, all that has come to a shocking and abrupt end in a way that I didn't anticipate was going to come to an end. Now, yes, Sharon. Oh, this is my bad. Okay, go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so that's another, that's another added thing. So Paula approached it from that, from the, for those of you who couldn't hear, Paula approached it from the idea that um, this isn't going the way that I thought it was going to go. Sharon brings up, am I just, did he forget that I was here? Maybe I need to remind, maybe I need to send, pro hey, by the way, I'm in a Roman prison over here. I could be doing a lot more good. What good does it do? You can imagine, John has been useful his entire life towards this end. 
And now he's sitting in a prison and he must think, for, for somebody who is mission driven, I don't know if any of you are, if any of you are mission driven like or objective driven, and now you're in jail, and what good can you do towards the mission there? Not much. It feels like nothing is getting done. Yes, Steve. But even John told his disciples, Jesus must be crazy. We must decrease. So he points out that John knew that he was going to have to decrease, but I don't think John thought, I'm going to decrease to nothingness. I'm going to decrease to rotting in a jail cell. I'm sure that didn't broach his topic. Now, we're going we're gonna to talk about this just a little bit more. But before we kind of dive into that, who is John the Baptist? Who is he? Okay, we're going to talk about that in just a second. So Steve says he's the Elijah to come. What else do we know about John the Baptist? I'm, I'm hearing something, but... He's the cousin of Jesus? Okay. Okay. In this passage, what does Jesus say about John the Baptist? Further down. There is nobody greater born of woman than John the Baptist. There is nobody. Think about that for a second. There is nobody greater born of woman to this point than John the Baptist. Says Jesus. And that is the man who's sitting in a jail cell thinking all the things that we've just been talking about. And if a man like that can think these things, are we immune? Definitely not. Yeah, Brian. Right. Yeah, all, all of those things are true. And I'm going to start with the last thing that Brian said, because I think the wording in that is really great. Even the people of the deepest faith are subject to confusion, are subject to doubt, are subject to questions. Just, just knowing the right answers, I've talked about the Kevlar of having the right answer. Just knowing the right answer doesn't necessarily make you immune to the idea of doubt to the idea of the unknown, to the idea of I'm not being used the way that I thought. And then furthermore, as Brian just pointed out, when Matthew's writing this in response to the, to the first century audience that's, that's reading this, it's kind of John is the perfect person to put in this role to, to be a typified response of the way we might react. Why isn't everybody turning to this Jesus? Why, why, why do doubts remain? And here's John languishing in prison thinking, have I been forgotten? Isn't there something more I could be doing? And we kind of hinted on this, and I should put that up there, but 1111 was a passage we just talked about. When circumstances and expectations collide, even the staunchest of believers deal with doubt. And I think every, every one of us in here in an adult Bible class know what it's like when expectations and, uh, and circumstances collide. When your reality meets with the way, when you thought things were going to go a certain way and then they don't go that way, that can be jarring to all of us. I found this quote here expectations are like fine pottery. The harder you hold them, the more likely they are to crack. I thought that was just great. You know, what's, you know what your expectations are like? Anybody have really flawed, in, in your expectations for how things are going to go, you know, uh, let's, let's choose something stupid and simple. Um, I have this expectation for how, you know, how dinner's going to go. It's going to be perfect. All the children are going to sit down right here like this, and they're going to they're gonna pick up their nice hot steaming 
pile of whatever Megan has made that is fantastic. And they're going to say, oh, this is so delicious. This is the most wonderful thing you've ever made. Thank you, mother, for, for making this. And, and we'll say a prayer and everyone will sit calmly and tell me about their day. And they'll say, oh, father, you're our great father. Thank you so much for providing this house. And that's my expectation. And it's like fine pottery. And I can sit it right here and I can stare at it. But what happens to expectations? They're, da- yeah, they're broken pretty quick, right quick. And I think all of you have experienced the exact same thing. Expectations are like that fine pottery or like that china that you registered for when you got your, we- when you got your wedding invite that you only break out when the Queen of England comes by and that never seems to happen and so it just sits in there. And it's just... It's just liable to break. And these are stupid things that I'm, you know, examples, but they are typified in the real life circumstances and people like what John is experiencing here. The staunchest of believers can deal with doubt and that is not, and we're going to see this here in just a moment, how Jesus deals with doubt. But the, the, the more central your expectation is about how things are going to go, about how Jesus is or how the church ought to be or how Christians ought to act. The more you hang on to that thing, the more you hold on to that thing so tightly, and that becomes the foundation of everything, how quickly does that crumble? We can have foundations that are Christ adjacent. Let me tell you, let me tell you what I mean. Brian brought up last time <laughs> that got me I think it got some of you about um, how he was sad when his children went away to college. And I just about had to come apart in the, in the seats last time. So uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time just thinking about it right now. Um, so, and, and Brian talked about how raising a good godly family is an important thing. It's, it's, it's a fundamental kind of thing. And we have expectations for how our family is going to be raised and how our children are going to be and that kind of thing. And that is Christ or Christianity adjacent. But if it's the foundation, if it's the thing, if, if your hopes and trust and your expectations are in that, is that Christ? No. That is a thing that's going to let you down. It's a thing that's not going to be there. It's, it's, it's not Christ himself. And that is causes us or can cause us to doubt. And here's John sitting in this prison cell thinking, I thought I was announcing something very different than what I'm getting. Now, also, like Brian just mentioned a moment ago, John kind of stands in for us as the ultimate example of, of uh, he's, he's amongst the best of us, and he's questioning. He's struggling. But what's important to note in this is how Jesus responds to John. How does Jesus respond to John? And, and I think there's something to note about doubt here, and I highlighted the word struggling. He's, str- he's actively, you can almost see John sitting in a jail cell, mentally trying to work these things out. The things that Paula mentioned, the things that Sharon mentioned, have I been forgotten? This isn't going where I thought it was going to go. And he's struggling. He's, there's an internal conflict. He hasn't just written Jesus off. That's not, that's not where he's at. But he's struggling to make sense of the world. Of the world. And what's What's John's solution? When John is sitting in a jail cell and he's struggling to make sense of things, what's the solution? Go ask Jesus. Again, another way I think that this is typified for us. When I'm sitting there and I'm struggling internally with the way the reality is not lining up with my expectations, what is the thing I should do? Go ask Jesus about it. And I think, again, that's another way that it's typified. But how does Jesus deal with the doubt of the struggling John the Baptist here? Say that again. Look at me. Look at me. Another key, uh, we talk about this a lot. We've had several Hebrews classes here. And the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12 that we fix our eyes on Jesus. And that's kind of the answer here. And specifically, he tells Jesus to look at what? Or he tells John to look at what? 
look at what I've done. Look at what I've done. And that's why I highlighted a second ago all those things. Go and tell John the things which you hear and see, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. All that you have heard, John, the things that you've been in prison, maybe, maybe about a year has passed since this is, since the two ministries started. I don't know how long John exactly has been in prison, and I don't know how many of the things John himself has seen. But Jesus says, hey, all the things that you're hearing, all those things that you, you have heard about in chapters 8 and 9 that Matthew presented to us, those things are real. Those things are happening, and those things are in fulfillment of prophecy that you, John, know as good as anyone. You know these things. In fact, most of the things that he talks about here have their origin in Isaiah, the very same book that Matthew quotes originally to talk about John the Baptist as being the messenger for the one. All that you've seen and heard is true. These things are happening. And never before in history has it been the like of it. We talked about this, you know, not that long ago. There's, there's no other, we couldn't think of any other society, any other group in which a man has come openly and done so many healings and miracles back to back to back to back to back like this. In the wide open where everybody can see it. And Jesus says, just look at the fact patterns, John, and know that this is true. And blessed are you, as he says in verse 6, if you don't stumble over me. It's really hard. It's really difficult. It doesn't line up with what you thought. And not much has changed from then to now. I want you to briefly imagine, I don't know if you've ever played this game. Have you ever played this game? What would, ha- what would it be like if Jesus came back, if Jesus was like here in the flesh walking around right now? If Jesus showed up here in Bowling Green, Kentucky today, or Washington, D.C., or New York City, or anywhere else, and he was just here today, what would it be like? I tell you what, I, here's, my, here's my thought experiment about this. I guarantee, just on name value alone, he would be on CNN, Fox News, he'd be speaking to the U.N., just at, at the drop of a hat, because the name value of Jesus today is worth a lot. But I'm also equally convinced that those people would be wildly disappointed. Because he's not what you thought. And blessed are you, John, if you don't stumble over me. Jesus is a rock of two kinds that's presented in Scripture. There are two kinds of rock that Jesus presented as. One is the cornerstone or foundation, and the other is a rock of stumbling. You're either going to build on him or you're going to bust on him. You're either going to build on him or you're going to bust on him one way or the other. And blessed are you, John, if you look at this, if you, struggling John, in, in the most kind way he can, Jesus appeals to him and says, just look at me, look at what I've done, look at what I am doing, and know that the scriptures are being fulfilled, that the expectations are being met, even if they aren't what you thought. Any other thoughts or comments on that section? Yes. Right, yes. So there's, so in addition to, that's, that's one of the things that's underplayed, in addition to all the miraculous things that he's doing, He's proclaiming good news to the poor. And that also, again, is from Isaiah, I think, 66, I think. Yeah, somewhere around there. Isaiah um, 61, it's, it's in that later part of Isaiah there. Uh, talking about the good news is proclaimed to the poor. People's lives, this is what we talked about in the past few classes. People's lives are fundamentally changing because of the work that Jesus is doing. So John, and we'll get back to this in just a moment because this comes up as well. Look at what I'm doing. Look at the fruits of what I'm doing, even if they're not the fruits that you anticipated, and know that I am the one. Any other thoughts or comments on that second? Yeah, Ethan. It brings to mind what we talked about this morning before the Lord's Supper. Like a prime example of someone, expectations being put on Jesus who were completely off. Right. And seeing right in front of them the real life, this is what I'm here to do, and know it's not matching what you might have thought going into it. And again, 
again, that's a Pharisee, someone who's supposed to know. Right. Ethan points out that even in, our, even in the Lord's Supper comments this morning, the Pharisee's expectations of a, what a prophet, who is a prophet? You know, that Pharisee had ideas about what a prophet was supposed to be. And Jesus walked in and he's like, this guy doesn't fit the mold of anything. Because if he had known what was going on here, he would not be game for what's happening right now. But it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. Any other thoughts or comments? So with that, let's go to the next section here. Oh, what, well, one more. Uh, I forgot. Let's not go to the next section. Let's continue on. Hold on one sec. Uh, so start in verse 7. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from, and from the days of John the Baptist until the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to receive it, he is the Elijah who is to come. He who has ears, let him hear. So Jesus waits until those two disciples get away. This is also another little subtle thing in here. Most people will say good things to your face and then talk badly about you after you walk away. And Jesus, again, does the exact opposite here. He, he says these things that John needs to hear and then seems to wait till those two disciples are out of earshot. And then he says what? He praises John profusely and says, this man is great. This is amongst the greatest of men born under women. But what, and he asked this question three times, three times. And some of these, like some of the other things that we've talked about in this class are a little bit obscure. So I'm going to try and break them down for you a little bit. So he asked the, he asked the multitude three times. He said, what did you go out to see? You, you went out to see, you had expectations when you went out to see John. What did you expect when you went out to go see John? A reed shaken in the wind, meaning a fickle preacher, someone who would tickle your ear, someone who would bend to popular opinion, someone who would be tossed and fro with every wind of doctrine that however the Jews might have liked it. That's not what you went out to see, and that's not what was out there. And this is maybe a little bit of, a, of an allegory to there being tall reeds out in that area where John preached. John's not a fickle preacher. He's not, some, he's not some loose guy that's out there saying whatever you want to see. So you didn't go out to see that. Did you go out to see prince or a prince or a royalty? Did you think you were going to go out and see some herald that's decked out in nice clothing? Somebody who was craving after luxury or, or royalty or craving after all the status that it can buy. You didn't go out. You didn't find that. In fact, what John spend his whole life wearing? The opposite of that, right? Some, some rough clothes, a leather belt, eating locusts. He's basically, if, if he's a herald for the king, he's the furthest thing dressed from a herald of a king that you could possibly imagine. He's, he's the least heraldic herald that there's ever been out there standing out by the Jordan. No, but what did you go to see? A prophet, a real prophet. The capstone prophet. This is the end prophet. Think about that. This is the last one. This is the last and greatest one right there at the very end. A real prophet, the herald of the Messiah. That's what you came out to see. That's what John is. And again, I think in some ways it's kind of reinforcing. If John can, if this is who John is and he can have these questions, so can you. With now impugning the Messiahship of Jesus the Christ. And if you can receive it, and this is what Steve mentioned earlier, if you can understand it, if you can, he uses the key phrase that's used over and over again in the book of Isaiah, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So in other words, don't be dull to this. Everybody wake up, pay attention to this. He is Elijah. Now, why does that matter? Why, why does that matter? Well, if you Okay, Elijah, Elijah I, the Old Testament, and turn back over to Malachi chapter 3. So he makes a reference here to Malachi. 
Malachi chapter 3. And let's read a little bit here from Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. This is exactly, this is exactly from uh, Jesus' comments in verse 10. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's soap, and he will, and he, and will, and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purge the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to their Lord an offering in righteousness. And then if you go to verse chapter 4, the whole of chapter 4 is the exact same way. And it ends in chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And another passage that we've seen already in Matthew. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Jews pay attention. He is the Elijah and he's not, he's bringing with him all the things that Malachi prophesied at the end. In other words, it's coming to purge you Jews. John, John is the Elijah and he's coming to purge you. Now, I also want to make just a brief comment here on, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this on verse 12, um, but this is one of those verses, if you read it, I'm not, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. It's very confusing. It can be very confusing. Um, the Greek here is very, uh, is, is, can be taken one of two different ways. If you read it, the exact, some people will read this exactly the way that Luke 16, 16 is. So if you go over to Luke 16, 16, it basically says the same thing. But in Luke's version, it basically says that there are people that are crowding into the kingdom of heaven. And so in other words, it's like, a bunch of people who are really zealous to take into the kingdom. It's not necessarily a negative thing. It's that people are storming the gates to get into the kingdom of heaven. And then there are people who take it the absolute opposite way and say, no, it's the violence and the persecution that's being already rendered to Jesus and John the Baptist. I'm taking no opinion on it one way or the other. I'm just telling you there's one of two ways that you can take that passage. And that's probably the least interesting thing to me in the chapter, but it's also one of the most confusing things in the chapter uh, to many people. So I wanted to give a, a, a simple nod to verse 12 before we move on. Now, with that on doubt, let's move over to disbelief. So this next section, starting in verse 16, deals with disbelief, and we won't read it for lack of time here. But verses 16 through 24 are interesting. And the verses 16 through 19, uh, I, I think we made allusions to this in a previous class, you Jews are impossible to please. <laughs> you didn't like it when John came and lived in as, as an ascetic. You didn't like that he was out there, that he was unbreakable, that he was unbendable. He was this guy, he was this unwieldy guy who was out there and he didn't feast and he didn't drink and he didn't do anything. And he just was out there. You didn't like that. And here comes the son of man and I'm with you. And I'm here and I'm feasting and I'm eating with you and I'm partaking. You said John has a demon, but you say I'm a glutton and a wine bibber. No matter how the gospel is presented to you, you hate it. You don't like it. It's not what you want. It's not what you think. We tried two completely disparate ways. And no matter how we presented it, you hated it. You didn't like it. You're, you, so no matter how we have it, you won't take it. And furthermore, and, and as he ends that section, he says, we presented it this way, we presented it that way, but wisdom is justified by her children, or wisdom is justified by her works. To the Jews, their wisdom, the way they thought it was supposed to be, they thought things were going to go a certain way, and when it didn't, they just rejected it outright because that was wisdom to them. Well, this can't be the Messiah because of reasons X, Y, and Z. But where does Malachi, as we just read about, say that ends? What does that end with? Their judgment. Man's wisdom, the way they, because it doesn't fit into my, your square peg doesn't fit into my round hole, no matter how we try and jam it in there, it ends in your judgment. But to Jesus, his wisdom was leading to the kingdom of heaven coming and breaking on the scene. 
And furthermore, he says, Woe, woe to Chorazin and woe to Bethsaida. For if all the things that have been done in those two cities, his basically the cities adjacent to his hometown, if all the things that he's been doing, all the things that's walking around, you remember what is the, what is the Old Testament uh, prophecy that the city, that the tribes of the north, that Naphtali and Issachar and those in them were in the north, they would see a great light. Have they seen a great light? They've seen an unbelievable, they've seen the most blinding of lights. And he says, if Tyre and Sidon had had those same revelations given to them, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. It would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than it's going to be for the cities that are adjacent to my hometown in the day of judgment because they do not believe and they will not repent despite their favored status from Messiah. They have not repented, they have not changed, and they are unbelieving and unrepentant. And in fact, in the, in the chapter we referenced this morning from Luke chapter 7, that's pretty much directly in there. They, they, the Pharisees in the areas of this, would not repent. They would not submit themselves to the baptism of John, and they would not submit themselves to this Messiah because they did not believe. And also note here how the doubt of John is very different than the disbelief of the Jews. Doubt and disbelief are very different things and display themselves very differently in the lives of those who doubt and those who do not believe. John and those who had flocked to John had repented. They had questions. They didn't understand. They didn't have all the answers. But there was inherent struggle. There was inherent, there was, there was conflict. There was inner conflict. And what does that inner conflict suggest? When you have inner conflict, what does that suggest? That there's two things inside of you that are trying to reconcile, that they're trying to bring towards the truth, that you're trying to, that you're wrestling with God, that you're trying to come to some solution. It, in, it indicates some level of faith, some level of belief, even though you don't have all the answers. But disbelief, unrepentant disbelief like this, what's it characteristic of? Dismissal. I don't care what he's doing. I don't care that he's out there raising people from the dead or that the lame can walk, or that the poor have the gospel preached them. Oh, that was the most absurd thing that the Pharisees had ever heard of, the gospel being preached to the poor. Luke makes that very clear. So they're just dismissive. The difference is people who are dismissive of the Messiah and those who struggle with the Messiah. And Jesus deals very, very differently with them. And we're going to see the rhetoric amped up throughout the rest of the book of Matthew, ultimately culminating in Matthew chapter 23. Any other thoughts on, on the disbelief on that section? Because I ultimately want to get to the comfort that Jesus offers here um, before we end class. So let's read section three, starting in verse 25. So at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Very comforting words here. Very comforting words. And I want to note just a few interesting things. We've talked about um, paradoxes. There's a few really interesting paradoxes in this in, that come out of this. Jesus' ministry. This comes, and Matthew does a really interesting thing here. Think about, I don't know if you're connecting these sections. Jesus' ministry has been ineffective in his home area, but he praises God for the way God is working. I've been, he just got done saying, woe to you, the area where I grew up, the, the Tri-Cities area up there around Capernaum. Woe to you, Tri-Cities area. But thank you, God, for the way that you're working your, your kingdom out. Seems to be a, a conflict of ideas. Seems to be an inherent paradox between those two things. Yet wisdom is justified by her children. And again, I think we see circumstances 
and expectations rightly ordered by Jesus. I'm sure that's not the way, the human part of Jesus, that's not the way he wanted things to go, is it? You can know that that's just not how he wanted things to go. But he praises God for the way the kingdom is working out in that area of the world. And also, we see that Jesus' ministry, as we talked about last time in, in, in chapter 10, 34 through 35, how a man's house, uh, those who seek after him, the households themselves are going to be at enmity. We talked about in, cha- in chapter 8, how the, the son of man has no home. He has nowhere to lie his head. And so his ministry, it seems, is full of hardships. But yet we, com- we compare that section with the light yoke that he offers. Again, this really interesting kind of paradox. And we also see, and this is not really a paradox as much as it is irony or kind of a juxtaposition that's going to go into, I think, what Brian's going to present next time. We see the lightness of Jesus highlighted in this section versus where we're going to start in chapter 12. We're going to see, we're going to see those two things collide. Matthew does a really good job ending this and then talking about the antithesis, antithesis of this in chapter 12 at the beginning there. But I want to, before we close here, this, I want to talk about the comfort of Jesus. Look at the words that Jesus says expresses about himself here. He's lowly in spirit. He's gentle. He's meek. You'll find rest for your souls. Who's this invitation to? Who's he talking to? Of whoever they are. To those who are weary. To those who are doubting. To those who are struggling. In that specific instance. To the Jews who've labored to keep Jewish tradition. That we're going to talk about next time in chapter 12. For all of you who have been struggling with that. What does Jesus offer? This goes back so well to the comments that that Justin made this morning. I, I just can't do anything but repeat it again from Psalms 130. If the Lord was to take account, if the Lord was keeping a tally mark of your sins, if he had up on the big board up here, like, okay, Sterling Borders, tally, 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 tally. And it would just go on. It would fill the screen. If the Lord was keeping count like that, like you'd expect a God to keep count, like you would expect a perfect good God to keep count, who could stand in the face of that? You'd you'd walk up and you'd just be overwhelmed by the tally marks that are next to your name. It would just be a mountain of things. It would just be, and so the heavy laden are those who are just walking around with this huge boulder And what does Jesus say? You just take that off because the yoke that I'm going to put on you is easy, is light because I'm not like what you thought I was like. I'm easy. I'm meek. I'm gentle. Next time we're going to pick up in Matthew chapter 12. Thank you for your attention this morning.